Before I tell you what I think about Stingrays, I'd like to tell you what the internet has to say about them. So, talk base. Is the Stingray versatile? No, it's not. Sorry, it's just not. There are any number of bases that are more versatile. The Stingray is a very versatile base. However, Fender makes this model called the Precision. It wins. I've had a Stingray for years, always loved the feel, consistency, and playability. However, I never really liked the sound too much. I found it very clacky from the fret noise. I always liked the sound of a P-Bass, so I just pulled out the pickup and active electronics and put a set of P-Bass pickups in it. I call it the P-Ray, and I like the sound of it quite a bit. And yes, it sounds like you would expect somewhere between a P-Bass and a Stingray. Well, I guess that's one way to do it. Should be worded, most versatile single pickup bass ever. I disagree. Music Mans have a definitive sound that is not as useful as Fender's. There are far more tracks recorded with precision and jazz basses than any other bass. As a bassist, I've owned five Music Mans since I started playing in the 70s. They have a particular sound that can be very useful, but the bottom and top end either work for what you're going for or not not as versatile. I bought one and sold it after a few years. I didn't find it versatile in my hands. It does the blindingly bright Stingray thing very well though. I think they're pretty overrated and one-dimensional, but that's just me. If you dig them, go for it. Music Man sounds boring to me. I much prefer the more organic P bass, single or split pickup, or the passive jazz bass. Music Man cuts through the mix without EQ, true, but a good engineer with decent EQ will pull out just what's needed from a P or a J and still remain the earthy tone. I own all three, a Getty Lee Signature Jazz, a Stingray, and an American P. The jazz is my favorite to play because it is the most versatile. Oh, okay, so the jazz bass is where it's at. The Stingray always sounds like a Stingray. Beautiful sound, but it is the least versatile of the three. The P bass is probably the best for the studio because of its big, heavy body, great tone, and sustain, especially the vintage ones. Ah, oh, this guy definitely knows his shit. He's got all the basses, and he says the P bass is the best for the studio. Don't forget to avoid active electronics in it if you want to be able to be dynamic in your playing. I hate the active stuff. It's like driving an old sports car with servo steering. Cannot feel the ground. I have no idea what servo steering is, but active electronics bad. Got it. The engineer told me that the jazz bass played very well, but the Music Man Stingray with his passive pickup and active electronics is the best bass for use in recording. Oh, uh, really the precision bass is the gold standard. Jazz bass can do a range of things, Stingray can do a different thing, but the first bass you get has to be a precision bass. Actually two precision basses, one with flat wounds and one with twangy wangy. If you like it, butt it. Me personally, I hate Stingrays. I find them to be butt ugly. There doesn't seem to be a clear consensus on Stingrays regarding their versatility. It kind of seems like anyone who wants to sell you one, like Andertons, will tell you that they are, and people who just don't like them will tell you that they're not. But maybe we should really dig down and figure out what versatile even means. In the most literal sense, versatility means the ability to adapt to different functions or activities. But by that definition, no bass is very versatile because all they do is play bass. Like, you can't cook a meal with a bass, a bass can't get you to the moon, you can't make a baby with a bass even though people keep trying. For the last time, guys, it's an output jack, not an input jack. Amps, on the other hand, but okay, let's say that versatile means that it can make a bunch of different kinds of sounds, but if that's the case, maybe the game changer would be more your style. I bet that you had no idea that this existed, and I bet Music Man wishes they could forget. <laughs> But the Stingray only has one pickup and usually only two or three EQ bands, so that can only take you so far, right? I hear a lot of people say the Stingray is a one-trick pony. Well, these folks are just dead wrong, because with EQ in your hands, you can get everything from pumping fat reggae to a razor edge slap tone. get great rock pick sounds. It's great for jazz soloing. So you tell me how this is a one trick pony. Huh. Well, that seems to square with this giant playlist that I found of just songs that were recorded on a Stingray. I didn't even make this one, but it has everything from Michael Jackson to Rage Against the Machine to the Brothers Johnson to Pantera to Aerosmith, Aeroplane, Alanis Morissette, Queen, Bowie, Elton John, John Lennon, and 
Paul, Paul Simon? Actually, I'm not sure about that last one. According to my information here, Still Crazy After All These Years was recorded in 1975, but The Stingray wasn't officially released until 1976, so that may not work. Tony Levin is the credited bass player on most of those tracks, and he is a very well-known Stingray player, so maybe there's a possibility that he had an early pre-production Stingray and then used it on that album? Hard to say. Based on the sound alone, I'd probably still say P-Bass, though. If you happen to know, I would be very curious to see your source, because this stuff is actually really hard to verify. I couldn't tell you what I had for breakfast yesterday, so it's a pretty safe bet that no one alive probably remembers what bass was used on those recordings, unless they wrote it down, or if there's a photo or anything like that. But if you know for sure, I'd love to see your source. In spite of the financial troubles that Music Man found themselves in during the Stingray's early years, players bought these like crazy, because they really loved its unique tone, and they loved the ergonomics kind of funny how bass players really seem to prioritize comfort. There are a lot of little innovations that Leo Fender sprinkled into the Stingray that are just not found on the Fender P and J. Things like the 3-in-1 headstock, which was an attempt to limit the dead spots that are notorious in those basses. It also makes the neck a little bit shorter. The neck profile falls somewhere between a Fender P and a J, which makes it strike a good balance between it being comfortable without it feeling insubstantial. The massive Alnico humbucker provides such a fat sound, but I think it's where that pickup is that really makes it work. While I would absolutely consider it just a bridge pickup, you can see that it's positioned just a little bit further forward than, say, a jazz bass pickup or the bridge pickup mounted on my L2500-inspired Sarek. What this translates to is that instead of it feeling a little bit thin and lacking low end like a lot of bridge pickups tend to do, the Stingray has all of the clarity from being close to the bridge and still has enough fatness from that giant humbucker to compensate. Add in the active preamp and baby, you got a stew going. All of these factors come together to give the Stingray a distinctive tone that is clear as a bell, but fat as hell with a capital P, and as we've seen, remarkably flexible. If the P-Bass has the thump and the Jazz Bass has the growl, then the Stingray, I would say, has the purr. It's such a smooth and sexy sound, and I have to wonder what an impact it had on the music that was being made at the time when it was released. There's always been this interesting link between art and technology, where new technology enables new kinds of art, and I kind of have to wonder if the arrival of the Stingray in the late 70s, early 80s had an impact on the hi-fi sound that was so prevalent during that time. I've been listening to a ton of early 80s new wave music, and there are stingrays all over that stuff. One of my favorite players from this era is John Taylor from Duran Duran. I feel like his bass lines really benefit from the stingrays' unique tone. <laughs> Should you play a Stingray? Well, yeah, they're awesome, of course. I made a video a long time ago called the Leo Trinity, and I should have called it the Leo Trio, missed opportunity, but I still think that having a P, a J, and a Stingray is such a great and well-rounded bass collection to have. And it doesn't have to be an expensive one either. Lately, it's starting to feel like American-made instruments aren't really providing a whole lot of value over their less expensive counterparts. Like, I have this Sterling Stingray, and I'm very happy with this, even with the stock electronics. Although, I will say that there is a lot of opportunity for modding, and if you need any inspiration or gas or whatever you want to do, just go check out Low and Lobster's Stingray modding series. And I've been su pretty surprised at how much variance there is between just different pickups and electronics. There are so many options for different flavors of Stingray tones, and you can take these cheap little basses and make them punch so far above their initial price point. As for me, I would love to paint this thing red, throw in a white EMG pickup and preamp, do gold hardware, but as it stands, I'm not really in a financial position to do that. But if that's something you'd like to see me do, consider giving me a dollar every month over on Patreon, and we'll buy a bunch of mods for the Stingray, right after I buy the Elden Ring DLC.